Hey everyone, and welcome to Invisible Walls episode 213 here on GameTrailers.com. We have some huge, huge news to share. Finally, we can tell you that the brand new Game Trailers is launching, and it is launching next Wednesday, June 27th. That's not going to change. <laughs> <laughs> Which <Yeah>. year? <laughs> this year. Yeah. I realize, yeah. you know, we brought this up, what was it, like three months ago? Sure. Yeah. A bunch of stuff <laughs> happened. I'm not going to go into all the details about it, but we have, I think it's like 200,000 videos or something that has all that information. We're building, rebuilding the site from the ground up, by the way. It's not just us reskinning it or uh, us just, you know, changing the look of the site. We started with the infrastructure and rebuilt it. So to those of you who have had issues with our site in the past, we did this for you. You're lying. We're just I'm switching. Not lying. We're switching to blogger. No, I see. Here's the <laughs> thing. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> here's the thing. Take I'm the over. one who has to deal with all the angry people. So, if somebody goes to post a blog and it doesn't work, it's Shane's fault. If someone leaves a comment on a video and their comment isn't there, it's Shane's fault. If somebody can't be added to a faction, it's Shane's fault. It's always my fault. So I have personal vested interest in fixing this site. <laughs> Once and for all. So that's what we've done. We've built it from the ground up all over again. Consequently, when you first start surfing the site, and everybody should come on Wednesday to check it out, it's going to run a little slow because you are caching all these brand new pages and modules for the first time. The more you use it, the faster the site will get. So please don't freak out on the very first day after you jump around through a few pages. And we'll things. just say it's a, it's a cloud-based uh, initiative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. But we do want to run over some of the big new features for you guys. Obviously, the biggest difference is our home page. Now, uh, you know, truth be told, we've built our name and our brand on having a newest list on our home page. Basically, a list of things that, as we publish something, it goes live. Well, over time, we've realized that a lot of the videos that we're putting up don't do a ton of traffic, and all they're doing is taking away from the visibility of stuff you guys actually want to see, bumping that stuff to the second and third page, it wasn't working for us, and it wasn't working for you. So now, all the videos on the home page are going to be hand-selected by folks like Ryan and I. Uh, basically, it's all going to be curated. We're going to make sure that we get all the big stuff in front of you guys at all times. Now, here's the thing. Uh, the newest list hasn't gone away. In fact, you know, just for the people, and we know there's a lot of you that really love that part of the site, we have created a brand new sortable video hub. So if you go to the video hub, you'll see the newest list there. Every day, it'll be just like the old GT. But if you want, you can go in and select a number of parameters to find exactly what you're looking for right from that hub. So one thing I would say about the new site is the whole thing is about curation. Uh, we want to get the big stuff in front of you guys and keep it there so you're not missing the stuff that you want to see. Obviously, we're still being just as thorough as we always have been with our new video hub. We're producing just as many videos as always. Uh, also, another focus is Side Mission, you mm -hmm. know, our new news blog. Hopefully, you guys have been reading that. Uh, it'll have a much bigger uh, space on the home page. Our original shows, which as time goes on, shows like Invisible Walls, Bonus Round, Angry Video Game Nerd, Hey Ash, all that type of stuff. Uh, we've built a brand new home for that, and that stuff will be featured on the home page because it is making up a much bigger and bigger portion of our video views over time. So I want to make sure that you guys can get to that. Also, a bigger focus on the games themselves instead of just particular videos. Uh, so you'll see at the bottom of the home page, there is a brand new module, basically a power ranking for games that's based on this crazy algorithm we've been working on uh, that basically is a function of how you guys interact with the site, how often you're watching the videos, how much you're commenting on each game. All that will culminate into a final top 10 power listing at the bottom of the site. And then we have new forums. Oh, well, the AAA game pages. AAA game pages. Um, our game pages were a lot like our home page where you go to, say, the page for The Last of Us. And all you'd see is this huge list. In some cases, at the end of a game's development cycle, yeah. that list would be like that long. Uh, well, we've trashed all that. Uh, the pages for each individual game now are organized. Uh, it's sucking the news, the screenshots, all the videos. Basically, everything is organized into kind of a love letter to each particular game, making it easy for you guys to find the latest updates to everything. Another problem we had, obviously, was we produce a new video for a game. After three days, it would go down into the list. You had no way of seeing what the newest stuff was. We have fixed a ton of stuff on the new GT. We have lost factions, not a part of the site, 
Maybe we can beg, borrow, and steal but and try to get a reinstituted. Message boards are better. Message boards are way better. You guys are going to love those. Um, we built a new calendar tool. There really isn't a good release date calendar on the internet right now, and we realize that because we need to do it for our jobs. Uh, so we have created a crazy extensive calendar tool uh, that you'll be able to sort by genre, platform. Uh, the dates are going to be up to the date by the day. Um, anything else that we're missing here, Ryan? I, I think mean, that's all the big stuff. But there's you'll, tons you'll of little things that you'll notice. Things. Uh, we don't want, in fact, we don't want to ruin everything because there is some cool stuff that we've done that you're we've only going to see. We've hit in a see. golden ticket. <laughs> <laughs> got the on golden one page. ticket. I'm excited for the fact that we're getting a new Invisible Walls homepage. I mean, yep. it's going to be a, a real hub where you can see lots of stuff, including bios, right. which uh, I think is kind of scary. I can't wait <laughs> to read bios. Ryan's bios. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everything's going to be more beavers. extensive. I think easier to navigate. Our homepage is way less cluttered, a lot more organized. And why we're able to do that organization is because of the way the rest of the site is now structured. So we hope you guys all love it. In fact, for next week's show, uh, we'll do an on the hook with you guys where you guys ask your questions about the new site, voice your concerns, and we'll answer them right here on the show. So make sure. When he says concerns, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to make sure that they don't involve, oh, your site sucks. Right, yeah, yeah. Be Let's try to be constructive here. Be constructive, here. and we'll take it from the, uh, from, uh, from the forums as well as Twitter and yeah, Facebook. Yeah. And keep in mind that we've worked very hard on this for a very long time, so uh, try not to be too mean. It'd be nice if we got some constructive criticism. Obviously, we want to make the site better. Uh, keep in mind that we've just launched the site, and pretty much every site that just launches has a few issues here and there. So anyway, with that, we'll get on with the show. Very excited to get your feedback, because honestly, the folks that watch Invisible Walls are really the core of GT. Uh, we know you're the biggest fans of the site, so we want to make sure that you guys absolutely love it. So I think that's it. Wednesday it launches. I'm sure you've seen the messages on the site. Check it out then. All right, so next we're going to run through the news very quickly. Not a ton of big stories this week, but a couple that are definitely making some waves. Uh, the first of which, Metal Gear Solid Five officially announced, although, I mean, it's been announced. It was, an, it, it was um, uh, Kojima did an uh, interview with a French video game magazine, and uh, he basically confirmed that Metal Gear Five was in development. He's using the Fox engine. Um, did we know that? I feel like I've known that for two I think years. He, now. You may you may have known that from like behind the scenes stuff. I don't know if they ever like officially, officially like I don't know if confirmed. they ever said five. Uh, yeah, you know one of those things <laughs> because right. you know Revengeance was uh, you know it has been front and center, and I know a lot of people are confused why you know why wasn't it at E3 or whatever. Well, that was kind of my pick for a game that I thought might show up randomly yeah. at E3 and it didn't. So, but I, I think it's it's uh, certainly an interesting tack from. Uh, um, Kojima and Konami to announce, you know, to announce this in passing almost in an interview, uh, especially when they had their, you know, they had their press conference for E3, which obviously went up on GT, and they had a big presence at the show. I'm guessing the only reason they really didn't make a, a big, you know, hoopla about it was because they don't want anything taken away from Revengeance. Yeah, I mean, well, they're not even developing that game at this point. I just can't understand why they're taking so long. I mean, the game should be out by now, not just announced. So, I mean, we're looking at what a Six-year development cycle for that game. I mean, well, the big news that's pretty is pretty ridiculous. Snake is back. I mean, Snake is back in Metal Gear Solid Five. So I'm guessing all the the, the MGS fanboys will be very. Is it very another happy prequel? That. Because that's kind of what happens when you get to the end of the road. It's like, oh, we wrapped up our trilogy. Now what are we gonna do? I'm They're looking at you, him. Gears. They're gonna clone him. Isn't he already a clone? Yeah, yeah I mean, so he's I don't know if I can follow him. What clone clone exactly he's he more is? Solid. More solid. He's like a robotic Less clone. <laughs> Doppelgang, I don't even know what... He's a soldier. Yeah, I mean, conceivably, he could, they could just make a robot that looks like Snake, and because the story's so convoluted anyway, like it's like, okay. It's gonna, but it's going to be interesting, because we're already talking about it. People are going to be curious. They want to know what happens to Snake. He's a very beloved character. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah, and so the other big news story, a huge, I guess it's huge, leak regarding the Xbox 720. Um... I think the reporter that reported on it has gone around and kind of said, look, you know, I've been, I guess he has a very good source who's been behind the scenes for him with Microsoft for a while, and he's looked at this document, and it looks like all the other internal documents that he's got leaked from Microsoft before. 
Um, some of the stuff in it, they talk about smart glass, but this document was from 2010. Yeah, basically, it's a 56-page document that went up, uh, you know, early uh, earlier in the week. And interestingly enough, I mean, even though Microsoft have done their usual, we don't comment on rumor or speculation. They had their lawyers take it down. It looks legit. It looks legit. I mean, some people have been saying, oh, either it's a fanboy's PowerPoint wet dream, <laughs> or it is something because it's it's full of marketing speak. I mean, there's definitely a, a lot of stuff in there. They talk about. Um, a 299 console that you never have to upgrade the hardware, and then tap into cloud-based gaming, um, and then they obviously talk about smart glass, which obviously was announced, was announced in E3. Yeah, E3. Um, but did they actually call it smart glass? They didn't talk. It, no, right? I mean it didn't this, actually use that marketing. They right? talked about functionality between cell phones right. and tablets. But it's the reason back in 2010, 2010 they probably yeah. didn't have the final name for it anyway. Yeah, what I thought was more interesting was the kind of Connect Two aspect of it, because at that point the Connect wasn't even the Connect One wasn't even out. Maybe well, I don't. Yeah. I don't know when the document actually was written or supposedly written, allegedly written. Actually, Connect was it was Christmas 2010. It was right around then. Yeah, yeah. So at the end. Yeah, yeah. So it's a little interesting that you know I'm not that surprised they were possibly already working on a revision, but it's still kind of curious. Because let's be honest, Connect. Eh, no, not really, Connect sucks. Not really the potential <laughs> we were we were hoping for. Yeah, I mean it's basically just a peripheral to play dance games with at this point, and, and we'll talk about Steel Battalion here in a little bit. Is there is there a more disingenuous? marketing phrase on the planet than better with connect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, herpes, better with connect. Maybe. <laughs> Diarrhea, better with connect. Maybe. Video games, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, you know, 299, never have to update. I mean, it sounds like I, it's that a, sounds it way sounds too like good a, to be true. Well, yeah. it sounds like a really fancy, dumb terminal with cloud computing behind it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you've got some onboard storage and some interface options, and you have uh, to mess around with stuff. It sounds like it's a cloud machine. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Microsoft are going to are ready to go that way yet. I think that's well, yeah, generation just, after next. I mean, just like how the yeah. PSP Go was too soon to go completely digital. Um, well, I, mean, I think we're still a little too far away to go completely cloud. Especially, I mean, it all comes back down to you know. I know the United States doesn't have bandwidth caps, but most of the world does. Yeah. And um, well, there are bandwidth I mean, caps here. Just lag well, I mean, and also, stuff like that until yeah. we get like the FiOS or the the real good internet infrastructure. I don't see it being viable. Yes, I realize like iPads have their little apps and everything, but it, those are still like two dollar purchases mm -hmm. for the most part. If it's really a cloud based system, then why would they show console specs in the same document? Well, one of the interesting Reverse things that um, was brought up was uh, they mentioned on live and actually mentioned it as a, p a potential acquisition oh. for Microsoft, which I could see making sense because everybody knows Microsoft has totally given up on PC gaming. Uh, you know, they're happy to sell Windows and whatever, but they really don't give a shit about the PC game space anymore. Um, I think you know it, this is one of those things. I well, mean, these documents come out; uh, they are you know they're made in 2010, and they they're probably being revised. 50 times since. Yeah, I mean, some of that stuff's going to be accurate. Some of it's not. Uh, I'm sure some of it was just theories that maybe they had or ideas that they had. Maybe they created that document for a huge brainstorming session where they start deciding what features they actually want to incorporate into the machine. Some of it rung true. I mean, obviously, the you know monetization, monetization, monetization of every single aspect of Xbox. I mean, they're doing that. Microsoft have just signed a deal, I think, with uh, with somebody for um, you know bigger ads that are going to come on XBLA this year. I mean, I have a big problem with uh, shelling out fifty or sixty bucks a month for, uh, a year for my Xbox Live membership and still having ads on top of it. I think it's bullshit. I agree as well. In fact, last night I was watching uh, Pitchfork, Pitchfork TV on. Xbox Live, and there are ads running just like the internet before I watch like a music video on Pitchfork. Something you pay you know, for a $60 subscription. And people will say, oh, cable television has that. But honestly, the, HBO the, does it. Yeah, the channels I pay, <laughs> pay premium uh, for, they don't. Yeah. So I think a $300 Xbox 720 would just destroy the market. I Imagine think, Nintendo's yeah. horror if, they had, if the 720 is 300 bucks. Well, it's interesting. Um, I think a uh, gentleman named Pacta on his uh, most recent uh, pack attack actually said that there is no chance, in his opinion, of uh, 720 coming out in 2013, which I find interesting. I mean, obviously, I would said that they were going to announce it this E3 and it would be out this Christmas. That's been and gone, but I, I think the Xbox in particular, that hardware is creaking. We've, you know, we've come out of it where Microsoft don't seem to give a shit. They gotta have something ready to go for, for Christmas 2013. I think it would just. It'll a, kill everybody. It'll kill them. us as a gaming website. It'll push the game. It'll push a lot of uh, a lot of people into. I think into almost recession mode. It'll take the industry to the brink. I believe. 
Yeah. Not necessarily yeah. as far as money, although the money will suffer. Uh, just mind share, entertainment mind share, um, being well, a big story. We won't see many new IPs, the, and this is the conversation we've had all along. People are saving the, the, a lot of their stuff for the for the new uh, for the new you know the new generation. I still think that next year we will see an Xbox, and I think we will see this, the, the high end PC games we saw at E3, the Watch Dogs, the, the Star Wars thirteen thirteen. They will. They will be then confirmed for they are coming to because they're not just going to come to BC. All right, so next we're going to talk about a franchise, well, a game, but a franchise that was really, I felt like had a lot of cachet with us and our audience, and that's Steel Battalion. Of course, the first game played with the awesome controller that yeah. literally you had to set aside a corner of your game room just to play. But there was something fun about it still, even despite the setup woes and everything, of actually maneuvering the levers and uh, I don't know what it was. Well, I like that even if you were really bad at the game, you could always flip the little fake glass switch and press the eject button right. and feel like, <laughs> well, at least I survived that. Because the game had permadeath. Well, so. it was, it was yeah. a, you know, every boy's dream. Well, yeah. well, you know, it's like you got to be the tank commander. You got to be the mech commander. You have these big ass things, and it's like, oh, look at all this and buttons yeah. and switches. I mean, and unfortunately, it cost three million dollars to yeah, buy it was one really copy pricey. of the game, but it sold out like instantly. Like it was because impossible. They made Ten of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think they made. I have no clue. They made a lot, but they all sold out, so you can't get them anymore. So here we are with the sequel. Instead of releasing this crazy controller or re-releasing it or finding some in warehouses somewhere. Uh, they've decided to make You are this the controller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're not. You also have one in your hands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now the game plays 100% with Kinect. Here's the other thing I can't figure out is why they wouldn't at least make the controller compatible with the game. Make a dongle? Yeah, I mean, all they need is some kind of a converter dongle to make it work. Go into the USB port. You could buy it for five bucks or whatever. They pack it in with the game. Well, my understanding is that you 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 basically have the majority of the stuff with Connect and Wavy Wavy, but you still have to use your controller as well. Yeah, the Connect's for the, all just for the for like, basic. It's for like looking. I mean, Chris, you you played it, right? <laughs> okay. It's for like two things, right? Walking, walking around. First person controls walking around and looking around are all with the controls and firing as well. Everything else, like shifting your your weapons or sh uh, trying to turn into like a, a sprint mode for your mm -hmm. mech. All of that is with the gesture controls and it's like this top left corner is gonna control like your light switch. So if you wanna turn on with night level, turn on your lights. Little things like that, like the equivalent of say looking down a scope in any other FPS is pulling down the periscope. So that feels it, but it, it's like know. little immersive things like, yeah. like it's like it is like what I was talking about with flipping the the eject button, but it's with the connect, and there is no real tangible thing there. I so I don't know. I think there's a disconnect, and I think it's so f funny that I I always felt like Microsoft was really paranoid to make controller tandem with connect. Like yeah. I thought that was a big no no, but now we're seeing it, and I was I like, don't think I was, they had a choice. With this well, game. I was like, I was like, well, this is interesting because I mean, there really isn't much that that does it, especially like core games, and now they've done it, and it's a complete disaster. Well, yeah. you, th you think about it. I mean. I would have liked to seen this game come out as one of the first games maybe that uses the smart glass. Because instead of waving your hand with Connect, yeah, you can use your controller, but you have your little tablet here. So totally you can press agree. you can press all those buttons because I'm hearing horror stories of like, yeah, we've the the mech's been hit, the, you know, the, the my crew is dying from smoke inhalation. I go to work the vent, I hit the button, it opens it. And then it closes it again. I try and hit it, and I try and hit it again. I hit the self-destruct, and it's it's an it's an automatic death. Yeah. <laughs> I spent five minutes trying to switch my weapons from like a heavy fire to a lighter fire, and I ended up doing everything in the cockpit except that. <laughs> they also say that you basically have to sit perfectly straight at a ninety-degree angle, and if you deviate a little bit this way or a little bit that way, you have to recalibrate. You don't sit perfectly straight. Or no, no. <laughs> definitely not. My posture is the proof of that. Maybe it's a secret posture game. Parents <laughs> should buy it for their kids. Ryan just gave me an idea. Can we not refer to this, uh, you know, this, this system as Connect anymore? Can we call it Disconnect? Yeah. Ooh. I like that. Just Disconnect. I mean, it, it's such a shame that a game that's like, you know, and having seen Hawken earlier, uh, you know, which is obviously, you know, a mech game, free to play. Obviously, you know it, it is on the PC, and the, amount, uh, the the way they integrate stuff. Admittedly, you have the keyboard. 
and then have something like Steel Battalion that's crying out for you know, using a bit of noggin and saying, all right, well, look, we cut, you know, no matter how much Microsoft is going to pay us to do the Kinect version, let's delay it. Let's go with this smart glass because Microsoft had to be talking to people about it. I can't I'm believe not, how many Kinects they've <laughs> sold. There are so many suckers out there. Yeah, but well, what's the attach rate of the software? That's what I want to say. Dance Central and Connect. Yeah, exactly. It's Dance Central. It's you know, it's all it's Zumba Dance. I mean, it's the people who bought the Wii Balance Board. Yeah. So, and you know, that's making that's making money. You know, you, you can't blame Microsoft for that. But what I uh, what you can blame them for is when they try and force this into hardcore games such as Ghost Recon, such as Steel Battalions, such as Mass Effect. I mean, you really don't want to be doing that. And I'm hoping that. We will start to see perhaps more casual stuff only on Connect, and then we'll see the smart glass technology implemented so that we can have some of the really cool stuff working with Mass Effect 4 or whatever you know we're going to see. Um, and that, I think that's the future for the hardcore gamer. Yeah, I feel like the casual consumers in our industry are just stupid. It's like <laughs> I we told them <laughs> Connect sucks. Segment. I Seriously, <laughs> I we told go. them Connect sucks, but they wouldn't. Listen, but that's the thing—they don't listen to us. We but are why? not their target. We're not their target audience. They—they they don't consider themselves. Where do they go to get their information? They just um, buy blindly and they don't do any research. CNN, Fox, why? NBC, because they—they they don't. You know, we are. You know, they will go to People magazine and see. Fucking, I don't know, Miley Cyrus shaking her ass with a balance board, and no. they think, oh, that's good. I mean, and, and you know, we are no longer, we are no longer. That the is good, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> well, now she's legal. It's good. Um, but you know, we're no no longer that core focus. You know, for you know, for that that part again. And, and look, I'm not saying they should come to Game Trailer specifically. I'm saying pretty much this entire industry told everybody that the Kinect was a piece of junk, and nobody listened to any of us. But, but they walk into a Best Buy and they hit some balls, and they're like, oh, this is cool. Yeah, they have they no frame it. of reference. I mean, you look at it. For the dancing games out. Ma majority, the games. you know, maybe women, older people who haven't, play, who haven't played games, maybe like the, like the Wii Bowling and the Wii Fit, and now they want to try, uh, try something different. They're not the ones who are going to buy Steel Battalions. If they are, they're in for a world of hurt. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's unfortunately, that's not, you know, Microsoft has said, that's, we are not their core business. You know, they've said that to us until the next console comes out. They're all about entertainment. They're all about mass market. That's what they want, and that's what Connect brings them. All right, so next we're going to check out a game that has been getting a ton of love in our Best of E3 awards. It is the free-to-play Hawken, and here to talk to us about it is Jason Hughes, the producer on the game. Jason, welcome to Invisible Wall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us. Are you shocked at all the positive feedback you've been getting on the game at E3? Really, the fr kind of the coming out party for the game, right? There's been, uh, the, the feedback coming off of E3 was, was unbelievable. Um, so many positive things uh, that people are saying about the game. People are genuinely excited about it, and that makes us really excited. It's sort of now we, all right, now heads down, let's, let's really deliver on, uh, on what people are excited about. Now this game has had an interesting development cycle. We saw it initially a couple years ago. We were really hyped on the game. We were working with PR trying to get exclusives for the game. It did really well on the site. And then it just kind of disappeared. And in fact, I think a lot of us maybe assumed it might have been canceled. Right. What happened there during that whole kind of period there where it was kind of radio silence? Well, I think uh, uh, it was, I think it was what, March? March of last year, I think is when that first trailer popped yeah. up. Um, and the game was in development a little bit before that, but really, it's a matter of it was such a small, such a small team. I mean, the studio was founded by uh, by four guys who are unbelievably talented, uh, and for the longest time, it was really four, five guys, up to maybe nine at the most, up for you know, like like for a year working mm -hmm. on the game. And it was only uh, sort of the middle to end of last year that momentum really started picking up. I mean, it was a small studio, so there's only so much they could do. Everyone was really focused working on the game. Uh, so there wasn't a, really a lot of time outside of the trailers and the gameplay footage that had been released. There wasn't really a lot of time to, to focus on uh, some of the PR and, and, and actually getting the game out there. So mm -hmm. it was, I think, uh, what the end, of, the end of last calendar year, uh, when we started talking about the publishing deal that we had and, and the direction for the game, going to free to play, that I think the momentum really started, uh, started picking up again. Now, why was the decision made to make this game free to play? Because I think one thing, as we were deliberating our Best of E3 awards, we kind of sat there and we're like, this game looks like a full-priced game. In fact, it looks better than a lot of full-priced games. Was it difficult to make that decision? And what kind of led into it? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. There's, 
there are a lot of games coming out right now. There's there's a lot of great stuff, and free to play is definitely gaining momentum. And yeah. it was something there was something that had been talked about for a while, but with the team being so small, it didn't really like it didn't wasn't that wasn't really a viable option. Uh, there, very few people, and, and that takes a lot of that takes a lot of work to, to really support that kind of game. Um, but as the as the popularity of that started growing last year, I mean, there's some awesome titles like League of Legends. Those guys are doing great with that business model. Um, we started thinking more about not necessarily as the business model, but building Hawken as uh, as a service and something that that has a lot of life. It's really difficult, I think, sometimes to launch a brand new IP, especially one that's multiplayer focused. You're worried about, you know, we want people in the lobbies, we want people playing. The last thing you want is for someone to throw down money for a game and then not be able to find a game. Uh, and what happens two weeks later is everyone moved on to something else. Right. I don't yeah. know. So yeah, we talked about multiplayer ghost towns recently, right? In yeah. Terms of, yeah. Yeah. You buy a game and then you're like, there's no one to play with. A week with. later, there's no yeah. one to play. Yeah. 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 That threshold, yeah, there's there's no one to play with. And that's and that's that's a scary thing. You don't want to put all this work into it and, and then have nobody playing. So free to play definitely helps. Uh, right. People can just download the game, start playing, and. It actually, free to play, I think, will help to extend the life of the game. Uh, we're going to support as long as people want to play it. We have such a, a wide amount of content that's that's planned. And we want to build it as a service that, that people care about and listen to the feedback and balance and um, just keep adding more stuff to it. So right. I think that actually gives us the ability to be more flexible and build it as something that's that hopefully will stick around. Yeah, I mean, I play a ton of League of Legends, love that game, and I think they have the right stance about how they're handling their free-to-play approach with just making the things you do pay for uh, purely cosmetic. Otherwise, right. everything, you know, with an actual gameplay function or anything that impacts balance in some way, like you can right. earn naturally. Um, wh what are your guys' plans for the cash shop? Yeah, tell uh, us about your, your pay to win. <laughs> the actual, <laughs> actual yeah. pay. How can I win harder <laughs> than the other guy? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, we have this one button that you you, you buy and you just automatically win. It's the win Sounds button. Sounds good. The <laughs> win button. Um, <laughs> oh, pay to I mean, pay to win is this, that's a scary thing, and that's something that uh, you know that's that's really difficult to balance, and it, it's I think what turns people off I think sometimes to the to the to the, the free to play model. It's it's a scary thing. And it's something we're definitely we're definitely aware of it, and we want to and we want to avoid that. Uh, so it, the trick is just about balance. I mean, we we need to generate some income so we can generate additional content. So it becomes well, how do you balance that with normal progression? You want people who you know decide to put money on some on some items to feel that it's it's worth the money and exciting to do so. But you also want people to not feel cheated if they decide not to. Right. Um, all right, I want to unlock items X, Y, and Z, but through normal progression. You know, so how long does it take to unlock that stuff? How long, you know, at what point does it become frustrating or good motivation? So a lot of that is balancing, but we mm -hmm. we don't want a situation where uh, things become off balance and, and people are upset that they're. You know, we want people to have fun no matter what. Um, so uh, that's a big thing is we want people to be able to unlock everything on their own so they don't feel frustrated and then monetization we just have to you know to balance basically that to make sure that it, it feels right on regardless of how you want to play now do you start at like the sixty dollar range and say now if somebody were to spend that much money on this game which would be the full price of a game they typically get at retail are you making sure that they kind of get the kitchen sink at that point if they spent that right. much money? That's something that, that, that we're definitely aware of. You think about, well, how much money are you spending and what are you getting for that? Uh, you know, games out today, you expect a certain amount of content for 60 bucks. You expect a certain amount of content for 50, for 40, whatever you're spending on a game. There, there's something in your mind that says, well, am I feeling like this has good value? Mm -hmm. uh, so anyone that wants to spend, you know, if someone spends $60 on a game, I fully believe like they should feel like they got sixty dollars worth of worth of stuff. It's something that we're definitely that we're definitely aware of and, and, and paying attention to. Mech games have kind of disappeared over the last seven or eight years. It used to be one of the most popular genres in the industry. Certainly used to get a lot of games from Japan in that genre. Right. A lot of those games haven't been coming over to the States recently. Why do you think that is and have you taken that into consideration when building Hawken? The origins of Hawken, it really became just love met games. And that was almost part of it. Like I haven't seen one in a while that was yeah. that was really exciting and one that, that we all wanted to that we all want to play, especially the the founders. Uh, um, you played uh, Steel Battalion. Steel Battalion, man, <laughs> that thing is awesome. The new one. No, um, it's not. <laughs> oh, the new one? Yeah. I have not played the new one yet. I have <laughs> not played the new one. <laughs> Uh, but it's it is funny this year. There's so many that are it's 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 coming it's coming back, and there's a lot of really you know exciting titles that come out. Maybe I don't know. Maybe apparently not. Maybe Steel Battalion. <laughs> but uh, um, 
Uh, but that name actually carries a lot of a lot of weight. You know, people have a certain expectation. Everyone remembers that awesome controller. That yeah. was uh, that was that was pretty crazy. But um, I think that part of that vacuum was part of the motivation. It's it's it was a genre that 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 everyone loved, and let's do something. Let's make one that that you know that we would want to play ourselves. And what does that mean as far as one that you want to play yourselves? What were the things you hated about old mech games that you guys have rectified in Hawken? I think there's there's definitely a mix, right? If you go back to, to some of the classics like uh, like more Mech Warrior Two, like everyone uh, everyone has such fond memories, I think of Mech Warrior Two. Yeah. Um, there are some games that are that came from the West. I think are definitely more um, more based on the simulation kind yeah. of kind of style. It, um, it's just a little bit slower. Uh, there's a little bit more micromanaging of of your mech and your weapons, and and there's nothing wrong with that. I've had a lot of fun with with that type uh, with that type of with that type of game. Um, there's a lot of you mentioned Japan. There's a lot of games that come out of Japan that are just really frantic and fast paced and, yeah. and jumping core. around Armor Core mm -hmm. that are definitely more sort of that arcade. So, sort of the thought was, well, what happens if you sort of try to find a medium between those? You take some of the customization, you take some of that uh, building your mech and having a connection element to it, uh, and then with maybe some faster paced gameplay over a simulation. You know, what happens if you try to find that in the middle? And and, and that's that's what we're trying to hit with the game. Yeah, one thing I found with uh, a lot of mech games is that they're so slow and lumbering that you almost feel at some points in those games that you're just a sitting duck. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's one thing I've seen with Hawken that feels completely different is the speed at which the game is played and how nimble even the larger mechs are. You're, you never feel like you're just stuck at a position and you have no chance to, right. to defend yourself. And, that, and that's a tricky thing to balance. You want people to have fun with it. You don't want people to be fighting the controls. But at the same time, you're in a mech. You want that mech feeling, that super powerful feeling of being in something that's heavy uh, and can do a lot of damage. So, you know, we want the gameplay to, you know, we have, there's, there's an idea of what the, what the pace of the game should be. And that's something that we're still balancing. But I think when people get their hands on it and start feeling it, they, they feel more of the mech feel, I think, when they're playing versus mm -hmm. than just watching it. Um, I mean, you guys had, to, had, had a chance to, to get some hands on. How did, yeah. how did you feel? I mean, I totally agree. Uh, one thing I liked about just playing it briefly was that um, movement matters. I think when people play games like Counter-Strike or Modern Warfare, they, they take what they could do with their kind of uh, line of sight for granted because you could really kind of play Twitch and look everywhere all at once. But with Hawken, uh, you really feel like you're in the mech. You feel like you're controlling this rotating cockpit that you have to be kind of very wary of uh, uh, where you're looking at at, at all times. And uh, it really lends to the sense of weight and power with each mech class. And you know, I found that I like the light one a lot, you know, moving around with the thrusters, um, sniping from afar. Rocket juice. Oh. Rocket, rocket juice. juice. Tap into the rocket Lots of rocket <laughs> juice is very important for my gameplay. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, I, I thought it was really fun. Like, cool. you got to play too, right, Justin? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the boost mechanics you guys have with the quick, the quick lateral movement and uh, the quick turn yeah, the dashing, things, essentially. Yeah, yeah I really yeah. like it. Okay, cool. Because cool. it gives you a quick, a quick dodge. You know, you feel like you can duck around a corner, or you have, you know, yeah. also the you have a chance turn. to unscrew yourself. The turn you yeah, it's yeah. really good. Although sometimes I was trying to boost backwards once, and I was like, "Oops!" <laughs> <laughs> now I'm getting <laughs> shot at. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, some cool movement stuff for sure. Cool. Mm -hmm. And that was that was part of you know that balance between uh, well, how fast do you actually move, but still being in a mech. It found like because you you don't want, I mean, you don't want it sitting there. It has weight. You don't want to feel like you know, you don't want to watch a mech just kind of speeding Zip around, all, yeah. zipping yeah. around all over the place. It doesn't feel you lose sort of that weight immersion. So mm -hmm. some of that was a was a creative solution to that issue. Where give it that quick dash, give it that quick win eighty, so you weren't doing this with the mouse to to kind of scroll over and get behind you, but give that quick boost to you know one eighty and get by you know whatever's behind you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like the audio in the game and the angle of being in the cockpit and how you guys affect it with the shaking and things like that. I feel like when you get hit, it has a real solid sense of impact. It's like you don't need someone to tell you you got hit. It's like, oh snap, where is this guy taking shots at me from? So uh, I'm really enjoying it. Now when you guys launch the game, what are you guys targeting to have in the opening package as far as maps and mechs and things like that? Right. Um, well, the I mean, we're, it, it's going to be spaced out a little bit. I mean, we're going to have um, basically from now until our open beta date, which is which is in December, is let's just sort of start ramping stuff up. We have to make sure that the game is ready to launch. We have to make sure that everything is as polished as, as we want it to be. We don't have a list yet of, well, this is what we want here, uh, and this is what we expect in this date. I mean, we know we have a general idea. You know, we're going to have these amount of mechs. We're going to have these amount of weapons. We're going to have these amount of maps. Um, and those are the ones that we feel comfortable in. I mean, we have 
a wide range of maps that we've been working on, for example, but they're all in various stages of, of polish. I mean, some haven't been touched in a while because we've been focused on other things. Right. So it really depends on what we feel uh, what we feel is is ready to go. So that's not something that we you know that we're locked down. We have our goals on that. We want you know definitely for there to be content for people to play with and, and can you know and, and to stay with it. Um, but we're not going to put anything out that we're you know that we're not happy with and we're not proud of. Especially when it comes to game modes. Uh, from from my past, I've run into a situation where if you launch sometimes with too many game modes, you you fracture the the player base. So. Yeah. Um, even if we just launch for you know deathmatch, team deathmatch, and you know siege mode, if we just kind of keep the numbers small for a little while to build that base, then we can start expanding with more maps, with more items. So, you know, the community grows, and all of a sudden, it's not impossible to find a match. Well, people have to learn how to play as well. Right. And while the controls in this game are crazy intuitive, there are some unique elements to it, sure. like we mentioned, using the shift to dash and and things like that. So it's almost a better idea to keep the modes tight, just so people can wrap their heads around actually operating the mechs and not worry so much about the modes and the objectives right. in the game. Uh, sometimes in games when you're trying to figure things out and you have other things you're trying to get sorted, it kind of detracts from the overall experience. And in that case, maybe you guys start leaking users, which is you know a huge issue for you guys. Don't want that. And and, and there there is a little bit of a learning curve right now. And some of that is... But slight. I would, I would with, say with most polish. mech games are not that way. They're usually very rigid, very complicated. This one, not so much. It's, okay. A nice balance between the two, I think. Good, good. That's 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 what we're that's what we're shooting for. At the same time, we don't want people to feel intimidated about jumping into multiplayer. Yeah. Um, so, what do we do to try to lower that? To try to level out that that learning curve a little bit. So that's all stuff that we're that, you know that we're playing with, and it really helps to have feedback. Um, uh, uh, Pax East was the first time you know we had that small. Uh, we had a really small just fan kind of event where we, we, we had people, just the public, come in, try the game out. I mean, I was there, I wanted to see feedback, I had forums, like I wanted, I wanted to hear what people had to say so we yeah, could take yeah. that back and, and, and know it was the first time that people had really had a chance to play. And so that's invaluable. And same thing with E3, like the comments that we were getting back, like that's invaluable so that people sitting down for the first time have never played it, what is their experience like and how can we help make that less confusing or feel a little better and, and so not only for getting the game out there and having people see it but also just how do they feel about it and, and how does it play for them that's that's invaluable to us now has the game ever had a, a single player campaign did you guys even approach doing one and because there isn't one how will people learn how to play the game is there a tutorial how does that work so we're that's part of like the learning curve we're definitely looking at uh, the possibility of a tutorial even like a smaller map to basically just sort of teach you the mechanics teach you how to play um, we have ideas for the game that aren't as competitive multiplayer focused um, there are more things that we want to explore like I don't want to rule anything out right now we're focused on multiplayer but we have a lot of ideas that aren't necessarily of the deathmatch kind of sort that that hopefully people will like and I mean the more people support the game the more stuff that we can that we can do with it so we've definitely thought about that the world is is really cool we uh, we like it we're excited about it and the more we can do with it the, the happier we'll be and hopefully everyone else will be happy with it too the plan from the beginning multiplayer only plan from thought the beginning was, was multiplayer like yeah, multiplayer only to focus on that, yeah. Is there anything cool that uh, maybe hasn't been shown off yet in trailers or gameplay out there yes. that you can share? <laughs> <laughs> that you can, can share. share. <laughs> you can share. Um, there's been some really cool stuff. We um, there hasn't been as much focus, I think, on E3 with uh, with the customization uh, that was shown, not like behind closed doors, but sort of off to the side. There's a lot of focus on uh, on the actual gameplay, which is great. But I think customization is something that uh, that hasn't had uh, as much attention, and mm -hmm. I think that's. I think when people see the depth and, and what we have in mind for it, what, what it is going to be is even more um, more robust than what we actually were showing at E3, but I think that gives a glimpse into what we have I in mind. So I think that is something that, while not, not necessarily a secret, I think mm -hmm. when people see that uh, and find out more about that, they'll be even more excited about, about what we're looking at for the game to be. Cool. Well, uh, Jason, thanks for coming. Um, but I have a couple questions before you go for our viewers. Are you planning on doing a private beta? Uh, we, we do have a closed beta. Uh, that will be, uh, so our open beta is 12.12.12. 12, 12, 12. Uh, and if people go to the website, playhawken.com, they can actually register for the closed beta. Now, we don't have a specific date for the closed beta, but I think people can probably 
put two and two together. You know how you know like it'll be before open beta, uh, open beta, but uh, you know it'll be enough time to like it's a real beta. Like right. we want, we want to get it out there. <laughs> we want to start testing stuff. It isn't uh, it isn't like a fake beta. So. Um, uh, yeah, so people should keep their eyes open for it. it. There will be something that's closed and private for sure. And will you be giving us some codes to give our viewers? I think we could probably do something with that. You heard it here. If you don't get him, blame him. You can come <laughs> after me. That's, uh, <laughs> you, you're, you're allowed. All right, Jason. Well, thank you for joining us here on Invisible Walls. Good luck finishing the game. And thank we you. can't wait for the beta. We'll be on there to uh, match some mechs with you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for having us. It's, no it's, problem. it's awesome to be here. All right, so next we're going to talk about a game that plays very similar to Portal, but it has an entirely different look and aesthetic. That game is Quant <laughs> Quantum Conundrum. And I QC, knew I was gonna have a <laughs> QC for the rest of the show. I knew I was going to have a problem saying that. Um, somehow I think it's probably not going to sell as well as Portal, just based upon the wrapper alone. And it's also, I mean, it's a DLC game, so it doesn't have that, I mean, But knows? Portal kind of started that way. It wasn't its own bundled. game, really, at first. It was bundled, and but right. Steam, I mean, Valve can also push whatever they want on Steam really easily. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the creative director behind uh, QC is, uh, was on the original Portal team, so there's that. But, you know, I think you can't have a first-person puzzle-solving game where you go through a mad scientist's lair from room to room and not evoke Portal. I wonder if uh, Valve is a little salty that he kind of went off and kind of took the she, idea. To she. She yeah. went off and uh, took the idea and used it in another game. Well, uh, I mean, it's still getting promoted on Steam and everything, so I think there's no, I don't think there's any bad blood. Feelings. I'm Actually, I can say for almost certain that if there is, it's pretty minimal, because if you pre-order the game, you get Team Fortress 2 items on Steam. Now, is she the one that came up with the concept? Because well, I don't know. The, the, the Nabicular drop team was a handful of people from DigiPen, so I'm not sure if one person per se can take full credit. But I'll also say, if you actually look at Nabicular, Narbicular, I can't even remember. If you look at that and think that this became Portal, uh, it's insane to think about it because it was like an isometric game with portals, but I mean right. it's so disconnected from whatever. I'm saying disconnected a lot from uh, from what Portal ended up being. But you know, Valve also. It's not just like these guys made Portal. It's like you know, Valve took their talented team and you know sprinkled in the clever writing, you know, sure. tons of focus tests or fo tons of testing and whatnot. But it's built on the concept of portals. I mean, that's really no, the it's foundation. Not. I'm saying Portal is. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, all yeah, the I'm other sorry. stuff is just set dressing. I mean, if you don't but have that mechanic, the game is nothing. I yeah, but Quantum is all about... But Quantum isn't that. You know, Quantum is still about abilities, but there's no portals in Quantum yeah, right. whatsoever. It's, uh, you can control, you can make things fluffy and light, super heavy, you can slow down time, and you can reverse gravity. And one of, any one of those things by themselves is not anything particularly mind-blowing. And the game does a pretty good job of making sure things, like they introduce one at a time, and does a good job of making sure they get intermingled or commingled uh, fairly early on, even though I, I think it takes, it takes quite a while to actually to finally get to the gravity. So you are jump, it's, they call them dimensions, you are switching between the dimensions to solve all these puzzles. But the, the puzzles themselves, uh, you kind of see the, the bag of tricks, I think, kind of early on. Like when you throw something that's heavy, and you throw it while it's fluffy, and then you go to slow mo so you can jump on it and ride it. It's pretty cool the first time you do it, yeah. but you're going to be doing that a lot. Yeah. And the more, there's a ton of puzzles. There's like 51, I think, officially, but like the puzzles are multi tiered, so it seems like a lot of puzzles. Are um, the puzzles basically defined by rooms? Yeah, yeah. totally. And then, you know, there's a, your, the story's forgettable. Your uncle is. You're a nephew nah, or a niece. Yeah. Matter. <laughs> he, sa he, says, he says some jokes, but he's no GLaDOS. I mean, yeah. it's hard not to draw the comparisons. Uh, he gives you some hints sometimes, which is kind of weird, because it made some of the more trickier puzzles easier. Uh -huh. And I felt like all the puzzles were fun to solve. No, none of the puzzles were duds, but I felt very few actually stood out. There was a handful of puzzles where um, there's a little battery, and you can it, what, what's plugged into the battery is which dimensions you can access. And there's a handful of puzzles where you actually have to choose which powers you have access to. Oh. And that kind of opened up things. But for the most part, you're given a, a limited set of tools, and you have to work with what you have, so you can just bang your head against the wall and solve it. There was, there's, you know, the physics are good, but I would, I can only think of maybe one puzzle off the top of my head where how physics really work beyond a baseline level of things that are heavy drop fast and things right. that are, you know, there's one puzzle where physics got really clever. Um, and you know, uh, I think we were talking about before in between recording that the aesthetic kind of has this 
you know, kind of a Saturday morning kind of plasticky, yeah, you I know, mean, a little saccharine feel. It kind of harkens back almost to when perhaps, you know, we were kids with the exception of Chris, because he still is one. Um, <laughs> but, you know, w w but if you look at like the 70s and the early 80s and you'd have, you know, these... Uh, Ruby Spears animation. Yeah, you'd have, <laughs> you'd have this really, you know, almost Hanna-Barbera. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, feel to it. You picture aside. And it, well, that, you know, okay, <laughs> Ruby Roo. <Roo>. Um, <laughs> but I think that's that's actually a smart thing because Portal is Portal's cool. Portal is you know an incredibly funny and well written game. Portal does have this kind of vicious undertone. Oh, it does. All yeah, the way it's through. Dark. Whereas QC is you know again fifteen dollars downloadable game. It feels like it's aimed at a younger generation. I don't have a problem with that. It's actually, for somebody like me, it appeals to me because like, it takes me back to when I was a little kid and I was watching this stuff and watching these educational shows where it's like, and if we you know, we take this heavy, yeah. this thing and it's Could, drop it. But you've only played a little bit of it. The problem is... I played the one, the one level the, that they had on the show at GDC. The problem is uh, the, game, the game pretty much show, it doesn't have, you know, it's a smaller team. They, there's not so much to it. You go to the rooms, you see the same couches, the same sofas, there's a little beaker bird that hits a button. It's funny, but by the end of the game, they've introduced a couple of other little elements. It all starts to look the same as well. So the puzzles, they get rearranged. It's kind of like some remixed stuff. There's a lot of puzzles, but the solutions start to feel a little similar and everything starts to feel a little similar. So it goes a little, little gray. And then the end game, I thought it was gonna pick up a little bit without spoiling anything. But it ends up being pretty short and not anything uh, too too spectacular. Nothing like, you know, when you played Portal 1 and the last puzzle is basically completely ripping down the Wizard of Oz robe, you know, right. or curtain and being, uh, you know, bamboozled. And it's, it's you know, it's I feel like you kind of have to evoke Portal because it's so much like it, but it's its own game as well. And yeah. as you said, it's $15, there's a ton of puzzles. None of the puzzles are bad. No. There's Could a couple collectibles. This? Would a kid be able to get You know, when, I, when the game yeah. premiered and they showed the very first puzzle, I'm like, this looks impossible. Um, I would say the game's very, very approachable. Uh, I, I think, you know, anyone, maybe 10 or up, you know, you play with it, the game does a good job of introducing things. The tutorials aren't boring, which is always a, a plus for this sort of thing. I think, uh, you know, a kid, like I said, for the most part, most things you can get through if you just kind of stare at it for a while and think about what is at your disposal. I think if, you, if you're perhaps intimidated by Portal and Portal 2, this is a nice alternative because, you know, there, there are sections of Portal 2, I sat there looking at the screen, for like 10, 15 minutes, like what the hell am I gonna do? And I just go onto Wikipedia. Yeah, I mean. You should try reviewing the game when oh you God, and two yeah. other people are playing it. And yeah. you don't Thanks. communicate with them, you have to figure it out. But, but even, the port, even speaking of Portal 2, which Portal 2 is way longer than Portal 1, like the um, the gels that yeah. affected things, I still don't think those did not hold a candle to this, still the actual just the portals yeah, themselves, yeah. you right. know? So getting that, that, that hook and Quantum does it by giving you kind of the gestalt of all these four abilities. But there's still nothing gestalt. individual really just stands there. All right, that's it for today's show. Uh, before we go, I want to remind you again, make sure you come back on Wednesday to check out the new site. And number two, number Marcus two. Beer. Number is, two. <laughs> exactly. Number two. <laughs> Marcus Beer uh, is going to start doing his own thing here on GT. Uh, hopefully you guys all watched uh, Annoyed Gamer's Worst of E3 2012. A lot of you guys love that. We're going to be giving you more of that. He's going to have his own weekly show. Uh, probably still a few weeks out, but just kind of wanted to tease it now. Uh, we're working on it. So look for Marcus's new show coming soon. And everybody have themselves an awesome weekend. Play as many games as you can. Summer's here. So play as many games as you can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you all next week. Invisible Walls is up and out. <laughs>